In the annals of history, the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917 is seen as a divergence in the political philosophy between the various far-left factions in the then-Russian provisional government. The Bolsheviks largely rejecting the gradualist approach to socialism that the Mensheviks professed. Rather, much of the Bolshevik leadership, like Vladimir Lenin, acted with a degree of exclusivity, that the revolution should be forceful and that it should be led by professional revolutionaries. This in reference to the intelligentsia. This distinction in political philosophy not only highlights the complexity of events in the year 1917, but it also evokes a darker image of Bolshevik power. Given the militant attitude of government takeover that the Bolsheviks espoused, many in the far right and anti-Semitic circles have used this as ammunition to highlight the disproportionate representation of Jews within the Bolshevik party. However, apart from the blatant forgery of documents such as the Elders of Zion, there's countless more literature trying to push this narrative. I will specifically be focusing on the misrepresentation of eyewitness accounts as well as contemporary literature of the day. To even understand Jewish appeal to the Bolsheviks, we must also analyze both the incentives to join the political party as well as the incentives to engage so ferociously in the Russian political process. This would do well to portray the greater complexity of the time period and would highlight the sources of lower quality. I'll also give context to the revolutionary experience of other ethnic minorities and their levels of political participation. Afterward, it would also be important to highlight post-revolutionary trends of political participation to see if it holds true whether the supposed Jewish overrepresentation was a long-term phenomenon or heavily distorted. The Jewish population in the Russian Empire was scarce until the completion of the partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1795. The reason being that Polish-Lithuania was among the earliest adopters of religious tolerance in Europe, thus promulgating a diversity of ethnic and religious minorities. With documents such as the 1573 Confederation of Warsaw, such guarantees allowed one group of people to establish themselves within the Polish-Lithuanian borders, the Jews. It is with no coincidence that with said partition, Russian Tsar Alexander I decreed a geographic area for Jewish habitation called the Pale of Settlement in 1804. These boundaries were further recalibrated by Tsar Nicholas I in 1835, further limiting the movement of Jews even within the Pale. To coincide with these methods of population control, Jewish youth suffered discriminatory military conscription laws at a younger age and at a higher rate. Although the highly illiberal conscription laws were reversed in the 1850s under the next Tsar, Alexander II, local systemic persecution of the Jews continued under what were known as pogroms. Following his assassination in 1881, Alexander II's successor, Alexander III, reversed Jewish rights by enacting the May Laws of 1882 and placing ethnic quotas in both secondary schools and universities. Jews were also excluded from politics, further alienating one of the few channels of legitimization to the Russian state. In addition, the Zemstvo councils imposed by Alexander II were retracted by Alexander III's counter-reforms of 1890, further eroding liberties. Your soul is mine. To give the situation context, Vladimir Lenin would go on to state, The further east one goes in Europe, the more cowardly, mean, and politically weak is the bourgeoisie, and the greater are the cultural and political tasks confronting the proletariat. This showed that the situation was perceived as not only being illiberal for the poor strata of society, but essentially for everyone that was not the Tsar. This isn't meant to be viewed from a Marxist lens, rather it is to give a glimpse of how the different political factions viewed the situation in its entirety. Such repression coupled with the after effects of serfdom would spark various worker strikes largely containing Jews in Minsk throughout the 1880s and 1890s. With Nicholas II as the new Tsar, more frequent restrictions on freedoms were put in place like the city government counter-reform of 1897 and the famous Pogrom of Kishinev. 
The intensity of autocracy compelled Jews to seek emancipation through participation in various political parties, like the Social Democratic Party, which had just split into the Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and the Jewish Bund, which didn't really get along with the Bolsheviks. This is to show that Jewish political participation was varied and widespread, often engaging in parties whose interests were at odds. This was followed by a revolutionary outpour in the year 1905, which resulted in even more programs like in Odessa and the death of over 100 Jews in Minsk's Central Square station. Even though a parliament was created due to the onset of revolutionary fervor, the Tsar still had a tight grip on Russia and was able to veto legislation. With Tsarist opposition growing in the first two state Dumas, the government responded by dissolving them and unconstitutionally changing the electoral system in order to produce a more docile assembly. It is in this context that we can see the autocratic rule that incentivized Jewish political orientation towards more radical political parties. Now the best way to really show this motivation for Jews to lean toward the more radical parties, like the Bolsheviks, is to analyze the Pale of Settlement, which is nowadays known as Belarus. Data from nearly a decade after the October Revolution shows that Belarusia was 8.2% Jewish. That may sound awfully small, but if we were to divide the social stratas of Belarusian society further, we could see that half of the Republic's urban population was Jewish, with a plurality in virtually all major cities. To add fuel to the fire, a further three-fourths of the urban proletariat were Jewish, meaning that they participated extensively in the unionization of labor. Vladimir Lenin expressed his views succinctly concerning the divide between the urban and agrarian societies. The proletariat must carry the democratic revolution to completion by applying itself to the mass of the peasantry to crush by force the resistance of the autocracy and to counter the instability of the bourgeoisie. The proletariat must accomplish the socialist revolution by applying itself to the mass of the semi-proletarian elements of the population to crush by force the resistance of the bourgeoisie and to counter the instability of the peasantry and the petty bourgeoisie. Thus the peasantry, which comprised the majority of the Belarusian and Russian populations, was excluded from maintaining a central role in the Bolshevik Party's program. And that such participation in the Bolshevik Party was extended to other ethnic minorities, which were mainly urban, like the Latvians. This explains why the Socialist Revolutionaries, another left-wing faction, was able to garner the majority of the votes in the 1917 elections at the Constituent Assembly, they emphasized less industrialization and basing their support on the interests of the Russian peasantry. The distinctions in party politics helps explain the nuance of party base support, however it still shows that an overwhelming amount of the Russian populace in 1917 favored a more left-wing political program. Even according to historians like Zvi Gittelman and Alyssa Bemparad, Jews struggled with the new Bolshevik institutions, as they did not sit in line with traditional Jewish culture. Considerations to the effect of the ongoing First World War should also be given, since the endless requisitions and the economic disruption of the regions along the front undermined the economy, provoking inflation that hit the poor particularly hard. It is no coincidence that apart from the Jews, the military in Latvia began voting for the Bolsheviks. Both the February and October revolutions in 1917 brought chaos that would evidently lead to civil war. However, it is important to observe what was occurring within the Jewish community. A British report from the time, titled Russia No. 1, a collection of reports in Bolshevism in Russia, added fuel to the fire of Jewish-Bolshevik conspiracy, as there were various anecdotal accounts of preferential Jewish treatment during the revolution. The problem is many of these are not eyewitness accounts. For example, according to one case, Siberian peasants made remarks stating that most Bolsheviks were Jews, although they had most likely never met a Jew in person. This was because Siberia was about as far from the Pale of Settlement as you can get, and it was largely controlled by the Whites during the beginning of the Civil War. However, there was also substantial evidence dispelling the myth of the Jewish-led Bolshevik conspiracy. One being that the same report stated that the Bolsheviks arrested prominent members of the Jewish Bund, which sparked protests from the Social Democratic Labor Party and the Jewish Socialist Parties. 
That same report also mentioned how a Jewish military cadet named Leonid Kanigisser assassinated the head of the Petrograd Cheka, Moise Uritsky, in 1918. The Cheka were the Bolshevik secret police who were seceded by the later NKVD. In addition, the report gave a glimpse as to the ethnic composition of Tsar Nicholas II's prison guards, which were 10 Lets and 3 Jews. Although stating that the Jews held prominent posts in the Bolshevik government, the report did not hesitate to include other ethnic minorities like Lets and Estonians. Another prominently used anti-Semitic book is Reverend Dennis Fahey's The Rulers of Russia. Here, he compiled several lists of Jews in the Bolshevik government, the Central Executive Committee, ambassadorial appointments, and so on. However, we will be focusing on the list outlining Lenin's cabinet, known as Sovnarkom. The first problem with the list is that there was no date associated with it, although Lenin's cabinet reshuffled multiple times. Thus, I had to cross-reference mention names and pictures to come up with an appropriate date. What I found was that the list most closely matched the cabinet of early 1918, as ministers of the 1917 cabinet, such as Milutin and Nogin, were missing, along with those of the 1919 cabinet, like Zerzinski and Rykov. This is because the list also included ministers like Karelin and Steinberg, who resigned in protest over the Brest-Litovsk Treaty in March 1918. The problem with that is that Isidore Gukovsky is listed as finance minister, although Menzinsky had not relinquished the post until April 1918. Apart from this, Proshyan is listed as agricultural minister, although he was actually the minister of postal and telegraph service. And Zinoviev is listed as minister of the interior, although that post was given to Petrovsky up until 1919. The book also cites Kaufman as being Minister of State Lands, but it was in fact Karelin. A. A. Kaufman was but an expert in the development of land reform, but also had nothing to do with the Council of People's Commissars. Finally, Alexandra Kolontai's name was even listed incorrectly as Minister of Social Relief. This shows that the author manipulated the data with an ambiguous date and inconsistent cabinet postings. It should also be noted that many other ministerial positions posted on the list weren't even in existence. So I decided to lurk further and track the ethnic composition of the 13 ministerial members at the time. I found that although the original list cited 77% of Lenin's cabinet as being Jews, I only found two people were explicitly of Jewish origins. Even discounting for the ministers that I couldn't find, the proportion of Jews in Lenin's cabinet was nowhere near 77%. It wasn't even half. Apart from that, the other ministers were easily traceable given their birthplace. For example, Kolegayev was born in Siberia and Karelin was born in Vladimir. Nowhere near the Pale of Settlement. Although Faye did not compile a list for the first Politburo, it is important to mention as it was the committee created in preparation for the October Revolution. I found that the real number for Jewish political participation in said committee was actually three members out of seven, with five having origins. However, people tend to forget that Russia is a very diverse country with admixture of different peoples and ethnicities. What is even more resounding is that two out of the three Politburo members, Zinoviev and Kamenev, voted against the violent retention of power. Here, they both stated that we are deeply convinced that to proclaim an armed insurrection now is to put at stake not only the fate of our party, but also the fate of the Russian and the international revolution. Such conservatism actually led to friction with Lenin, thus showing that only two Jewish members of the Politburo actually supported the Bolshevik revolution. This even goes to show that Jewish participation in the revolution was not the only one that was out of proportion. Letts largely controlled the Cheka with only three Jewish commissars out of 70 total. The disproportion was even seen at higher rates in the Cheka's Moscow central office, although the overall 1921 membership of the Cheka was more calibrated. Even Felix Derzinski's closest colleagues were Letts, and this is something that is seemingly common knowledge to Latvians today. So why is there no Latvian Bolshevik conspiracy? Because there shouldn't be one. Different parties and political systems will often garner voting support based on cross-cutting cleavages. 
Jews were highly urbanized and thus resonated well with the proletariat message of the Bolsheviks. However, this didn't mean they controlled the party, especially when they were often in the minority. It is even supported by the fact that many Jewish people existed like Kanegisser, such as Fanny Kaplan, who tried to assassinate Vladimir Lenin, or the Jewish-British spy Sidney Riley, who was eventually executed by Soviet forces. Jewish participation even declined after the revolution, given the association they allegedly had with Leon Trotsky, who was a vehement rival of Joseph Stalin. Stalin, who became the new leader of the Soviet Union, was fiercely anti-Semitic in that there were no Jews in the Politburo from 1926 to 1930, and Jewish political participation further degraded from the 1940s onward. He even stopped his daughter Svetlana from marrying a Jew. Such undertones of what was to come from Stalin's anti-cosmopolitan campaign emerged during the Second World War. In 1940, for example, he exchanged over 800 Austrian and German communist Jews with Nazi Germany at Brest-Litovsk, and in 1941 he allowed for the creation of the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. However, by the end of the war, Stalin used the deaths of two former colleagues as a pretext to instigate arrests and assassinations, thus killing most of the organization. This was paired with the removal of Yevgeny Kaldai from the TASS news agency, who was known for taking the famous picture in the Reichstag. But the truth of the matter is that the chaos reached its peak in 1953 with the doctor's plot. Several prominent doctors were arrested and charged with attempting to kill Soviet officials. Most of them were Jewish. Such hysteria continued to the point where some have speculated that Stalin was planning a mass deportation of Jews to Siberia. However, this is quite unlikely. With the death of Stalin in 1953, the anti-cosmopolitan campaign stopped, with Jewish political representation slowly coming into proportion of the Soviet national population. It is true that some of this was due to Jewish immigration to Israel, but it also demonstrates that Jewish participation in the Bolshevik Revolution has been both overstated and was in effect temporary.